everyone, this is Sidra and today we're talking about fluids. This is something that's really important to learn and unfortunately there's not a lot of uh, resources that teach fluids to us even though it's super common to prescribe them. Almost every patient ends up on fluids so let's talk about it. Majority of our body is made up of water. Up to 60% of our weight consists of water. This can vary with adipose tissue so females tend to have less water content about 50 percent whereas neonates have up to 75 percent because they lack adipose tissue there's a few compartments in our body that contain fluid and one of them is the intracellular compartment cells are really tiny but all together they contain majority of the water in our body uh, up to 40 percent out of the 60. The remainder of the 20% forms the extracellular fluid, some of it uh, that we know as blood makes up 5%, whereas the rest surrounds those cells and keeps them hydrated, and that's 15% in the interstitium. Remember that blood is also a kind of interstitium because it contains red blood cells and white blood cells. The compartments share water, but they are different in electrolytes. Cells, remember, are bags of potassium. They also contain magnesium and lots of phosphates in the form of ATP, ADP, and AMP. Whereas the in interstitium is the ocean that we evolved in, so it contains a large amount of sodium and chloride and less potassium. Um, capillaries are leaky, so interstitium and the plasma have a similar content of electrolytes, but they do differ in protein content which blood contains in the form of albumin. So what happens is that the heart pumps blood into the capillaries under a lot of pressure called hydrostatic pressure. It goes into the tissues, uh, surrounds them, gives the cells its nutrients, and then is attracted back into the blood vessels by the oncotic pressure exerted by the albumin. You can think of it kind of like a pump with a leaky hose attached to it. When we give a liter of saline through the vein, what happens is because the interstitium is so large, it will get most of that water. So it'll get 750 mils out of that one liter and only 250 will stay in the blood and that's proportional to the size of these fluid compartments. Now that we've described the three compartments, let's talk about hydration. Hydration is when there's fluid, adequate fluid in all three of these compartments. Why are we discussing solutes in a fluid video? Well, the thing is that water often follows salt or the solutes. So it's important to know their concentration and their amounts. And um, the amount of solutes is measured with osmolarity or osmolality. Now the difference between the osmolarity and osmolality is not just the spelling but also that it's measured in milliosms per liter whereas osmolality is in kg. The normal range of the human plasma is around 275 to 295 milliosms per liter or you can just say around 300. Osmolarity is the same across all three compartments if everything is going well. Now cells have a bilipid membrane that prevent um, solutes from going in and out but water has no problem. When you place a cell inside a solution that has the same number of solutes or the same osmolarity as the cell, the fluid movement, um, there's no big shift so it's called an isotonic solution. When you place a cell in a solution that has a lot of um, solutes in it, so a hyperosmolar solution, water will come out of the cell to balance this osmolarity and it's called a hypertonic solution. The cell will shrink, uh, the intracellular fluid compartment will shrink and the extracellular fluid compartment will expand. Now we're placing the cell in a solution that has solutes that are way less than what's inside so it's hyperosmolar and the net fluid movement is inside the, uh, the cell to balance out the osmolarities. So with a hypotonic solution your intracellular fluid compartment will expand and extracellular compartment will shrink. Now that we've understood the various compartments, how fluid shifts in and out of cells, let's talk about the various types of 
fluids available to us. There's two big categories. One is crystalloids and the other colloids. So the difference between them is the size of the molecules present in each. Crystalloids can come in isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic forms. The most common isotonic solutions are 0.9% uh, NaCl, which is called normal saline, and it contains 154 millimoles per liter of sodium and of chloride. The bad thing with this is that too much of it can cause hyperchloremic acidosis and sodium really um, burdens your kidneys. The next is Hartman's, also known as Ringer's lactate. This is the surgeon's fluid. It is very physiologically close to plasma. It has 130 millimoles of sodium, 4 of potassium, 111 of chloride, and 3 of uh, calcium. There's lactate present in it, which is metabolized by the liver and turns into bicarb, of which there is 28 millimoles per liter. There is a small chance of hyperkalemia with Ringer's lactate, but you'd have to give 10 liters of it to actually cause a cardiac arrhythmia. There's Ringer's solution, which is very similar to Ringer's lactate, but without the actual lactate. We have 5% dextrose, which is basically free water with a little bit of glucose in it. It's an isotonic solution, which is metabolized into a hypotonic solution. There's 5 grams of glucose in 100 mils of um, water. It's used to both expand intracellular and extracellular fluid compartments. Next up, we have hyper potonic solutions there's half normal saline which contains 77 millimoles of sodium and chloride per liter there's quarter normal saline with four percent dextrose i meant to write it's called saline dex and it's used for maintenance because it doesn't have a huge amount of sodium it's used in hypernatremia again because it doesn't have a huge amount of sodium it has the right amount and in DK as well as hyperosmolar hyperglycemic states. So it contains 30 millimoles of sodium and chloride and whatever glucose you get from the 4% dextrose. Next up, we have hypertonic solutions such as 3% NaCl. These are used in um, hyponatremias and cerebral edema to draw water out. There's D10, D20, and D50 as well. Coming to colloids, there's albumin, gelatin-containing solutions, and tetrastarch. Never ever use tetrastarch. There's a risk of anaphylaxis with all colloids, but especially tetrastarch and and there's a significant risk of renal failure as well. Studies have shown that crystalloids are better than col colloids in the initial resuscitation anyway, so their routine use is not recommended. Colloids and hypertonic solutions are volume expanders. If you look at the tonicity diagram, that'll explain it to you. Um, blood is another colloid that is safe to give especially packed red blood cells, and you should always replace blood with blood. This was part one of fluids. Next week, we will be discussing how to actually assess a patient who needs fluids and which fluids to give in which situation. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, share the video, and subscribe to the channel. See you soon!